Flames fans, it's time for Flames Unfiltered, your spot for Calgary Flames Hockey Talk. Camp has opened, preseason games are being played, and all I can think about is the regular season. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Flames Unfiltered as we roll into uh, a preseason edition, episode 135, uh, recorded and actually right before the Edmonton Oilers take on the Calgary Flames in a preseason battle. I am the host of the show, Brad Rude, joined alongside my co-host Kyle Lewis. Kyle, good to have you with us again tonight. Always a pleasure and uh, got a little bit more to talk about as the weeks go by. It's getting more and more exciting. It is, it is. It's, it's uh Shoot, kind of a lot of things came up this week when I was looking at the, when I was kind of going through what we were going to talk about. I'm like, oh, we got to talk about him, and we got to talk about him, and <laughs> it's uh, yeah, that's that's a good sign though. That that's a good thing, you know. I have uh, some camp news to talk about. Where um, last week we just uh, talked about waiting and wishing. So um, yeah, we're good to be back. Uh, no, little, hopefully, no audio problems this week. Last week we kind of had a little a little rodeo before we got started uh getting the the sound levels to where we are but uh hopefully we got that ironed out so far so good anyway sounds yeah. clear even looks a little bit clear <laughs> it does doesn't it yeah it's funny how a couple weeks does that for us um preseason did you watch um were you able to watch any of the i, I know you were because we were communicating the vancouver split squad I was actually flipping back and forth between the two of them. Now, one on uh, through the Flames website, and the other one on on national television. The away game being the the one on national television. But yeah, I actually caught just about all of, of both of them. It was hard to watch both games, though, wasn't it? it well, yeah, you kind of have to decide who you want to focus on for for certain players, right? And I try know. to stick, almost like a scout and try to stick to that game because you just otherwise you just get pulled apart so much between the two. You're not really paying attention to either one. I was back and forth, and after a period, I was like, what am I doing? I don't even know what happened. And I, <laughs> I, was, I, I was complaining to my wife, and my wife looks at me, and she's like, quit complaining. You've been wanting hockey for a long time, so like this is a, two games sounds like a pretty damn good thing. So Yeah, it's a good problem to have. It is. It is. So, um, yeah, and then I watched a little bit of hockey action last night, and tonight I'm going to try to see as much of that uh, Flames-Oilers game, and uh, that, that should be an interesting one. So Well, I had heard that... Uh... The Oilers were dressing more or less an AH, yeah an AHL roster. Meanwhile, the Flames, Huberto, Kadri, like almost I'm not <laughs> a full squad. Like I'm serious, like almost a full squad. Yeah, I don't. I'll have to wait and you know until the puck drops. Just seems a little a little odd. But I mean, at the same time, it's training camp. They'll focus on building some chemistry and you know, amongst the guys they know are going to be on the team. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Kind of a Daryl Sutter thing though. Like he just oh yeah, absolutely. I know he's thinking the same thing as me. It's like screw these games. Let's just get to let's get to game one. Yeah, he ba- he basically said that in a Daryl Suttery way to today. I think actually. Yeah. Somebody asked some questions. Like, yeah, it's preseason. Doesn't matter. You know, move on. We got some good good news this week, Kyle. We uh, I found out that uh, Flames Unfiltered has moved into the top one hundred for hockey podcasts. So um, that is good news, and uh, hopefully we can keep. Uh, pushing it up and up and up the charts and uh yeah thanks to all our listeners and uh i know a lot of you have stayed faithful over the uh three plus years we're heading into our fourth season and uh we appreciate that so hey first episode as co-host and that's what happens i uh yeah. I, I, gotta, I gotta take a little bit of pride oh, in that right yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's why i fired the message off to you right away so, that's, that. that's that's fantastic let's keep it going <laughs> no, that, that, it's, that, that is good news. And uh, everybody that did join when Kyle joined to watch the show, uh, we appreciate it. And hopefully, uh, hopefully we can entertain yeah. you over the winter. And uh, I'm sure there's times you're going to think we're stupid. And I'm sure there's times you're going to think, ah, these guys know what they're talking about. So it's all part of the game, right? 100%, man. You know it. On today's episode, we're going to recap those three preseason games. And uh, then we're going to roll into a bunch of different training camp notes and things that have happened and what questions do this does this team have to answer um coming out of training camp and um, what positions are open and then we'll roll into discussion on the top two lines how we're going to build those lines who's going to fit in the best who we think is going to make a push for those top two lines and kyle and i'll give you our take on that and then we'll discuss some flames news and um, talk about the fittest flame gaudreau's comments a weaker contract 
And uh, yeah, we'll update on injuries and then we'll preview what's left of the preseason games. And just, this week's a busy week and, and, and going to be a real telling week for the Flames um, in the preseason front. Um, thanks for joining us on another edition of Flames Unfiltered. All right, Kyle, we got live hockey action to talk about. Is uh, Calgary the split squad? Let's just roll through those games real quickly, talk about who scored, who didn't score, who we thought looked good, and, and who we thought uh, maybe didn't look so hot. Uh, and I don't know. I, like It was hard to watch. It was hard to watch both of them. But uh, um, a good problem to have. As far as Flames players that stood out that night, I mean, I'm not going to talk about – let's not talk about uh, – individual games but probably more players since you get the games confused on who is playing and who yeah but yep. the flames did win in vancouver three two in overtime and then they they won the home game four to nothing you know in a much more veteran laden roster um yep. let's talk about the vancouver one first uh michael stone gets a game winner on the power play in overtime on a great pass from from michael phelps and uh, th- uh, that was that was our matthew phelps sorry um that was a goal that I, I could just see it coming, couldn't you? I saw Stone kind of going down the side. I'm like, oh boy. This, this yeah, you, he, when he starts to, to kind of float towards the half board, it's like you know, especially on his offside, you know exactly what he's going to do. And there's a, as I said before, a pretty good chance he's going to hit the net. And that's exactly what he did. So, yeah. All in all, a, a good game. Goals from McLean, Jones, and Stone to win that one. In the home game, uh, Huberto scores and. What was your take on your initial assessment the first time we see Jonathan Hubert on a Flames jersey? Very, very skilled, which we knew, but not you know, seeing many of his games other than a few highlights, I guess, of the Panthers. You, big appreciation for his skill level, uh, especially along the boards. I think I mentioned to you when we were, we were texting there, one play he made to exit the defensive zone, a, a pass to Lindholm at center ice, and it was just so beautifully executed, like just so seamless, made it look so easy. Like, and on, and on his goal, too, like in tight, like just great hands. Um, yeah, ex- extremely skilled player. Very, very happy to have him. So, you know, I was super excited when this when this trade happened. Uh, I've always thought Jonathan Huberto was one of, one of the elite in the league. Yep. And after watching... You know, and I, t- I tried to look at it objectively because I didn't want to be like, oh, you know, I, I'm in love with Jonathan Huberto now and, and he's everything he does is perfect. Because um, yeah, as you'll learn after you watch the show and after you work with me for a while, Kyle, I, I tell it like it is, whether it's good or bad on a player, um, even if it's my favorite player. But I thought Jonathan Huberto just looked uh, very composed with the puck. Yep. Um, very strong. Um, actually had a few body checks that I thought were, we're pretty solid checks for a preseason game. And uh, all in all, it's just super, super impressed. And uh, he, he really stood out for me. Um, it, it was fun to watch. It was fun to fun to watch him. And I'm looking forward to seeing how Cadre looks tonight. So um, hopefully he can have a, a good start just like Jonathan Huberto did. And all in all, good games. I thought Dan Valadar looked really good in, the, in, that, in that game. Um, Valadar was great yesterday, too. He's at a really strong camp. Yeah, really strong camp. I, th- I think I saw at one point, I know this, I mean, this isn't at the end of the game yesterday, but I saw at one point through like five periods, he had stopped 47 or 49, and like a 0. 0.951. And, and that's, I know, and that's a great sign. I know yeah. everybody wants Dustin Wolf to, to, to step up. And um, I, I just think what we have right now with Markstrom being the number one and Vladar proving that he can be a great, great tandem and then having Wolf in, in the wings. Boy, could you ask for more in far as far as goaltending goes? Find me a team that has better goaltending depth right now than Calgary. I, I, and I, and I mean that, you know, anybody who's listening, if you want to tweet out who you think it is, I, I would love to hear it. I'd love I to look at goaltenders. Yeah. Cause I think I would, I would go to bat saying that if you look at AHL, NHL, the two tandems, we may have the best tandem in the NHL and the best tandem in the AHL too. Yep, I don't think there's I don't think there's any any question. Now you could make a case for saying maybe there's maybe there's a better NHL tandem, but in terms of organizational depth as a whole, I don't think they're beat right now. 
I, I don't either. I, I don't. I, I'm. <laughs> and you know how many years did we go? We're getting off on a little tangent, but that's all right. You know, you know how many years did we go where it was like, all right, who's starting tonight? How is this going to go? <laughs> And the, the name's just going through my head right now. You know, it's like, can we got to get through the first three or four saves here? And it's like, you know, now we don't have to worry about that. It's like, even if Markstrom lets one in early, I just, I, I don't know. I, I feel like he's just composed. And I, and I know people could tweet me and, and argue with me on how he was in the playoffs last year. But, you know. And that's I, fair. I that's fair. But, yeah. It is. It is. But I will dare bet we see a completely different Jacob Markstrom come playoffs this year. I suspect so, and I also am hoping that Vladar did enough last year. I certainly thought he did and does enough in this camp to warrant more playing time because I do think part of Markstrom's issue uh, was fatigue down the stretch. You know, a lot of people say that, and and I don't disagree with that. Uh, I just worry a little bit if Daryl pushes it a little bit too much. And, and, and if he will again this year, um, yeah. last year, you know, Markstrom had a couple breaks where he had a couple seven game or seven day stretches where he didn't play. I know there was one coming out of the COVID goofiness, either going out of it or going, going into it. Right. I know he had a long extended break and there were, there was a couple of them, um, which I think helped. But it'll be interesting to see how they manage the schedule this year with, uh, without a COVID break. Knock on wood, pray to God. I don't think we'll have that this year. But um, I can't see it. Well, they just dropped a bunch of the restrictions in Canada too, so I think we're still in the in the thaw period, so to speak. So hopefully, we're in the clear. Yeah, I, I think we are. I think uh, mindsets have changed drastically on that. So um, yeah. I, I I don't know. I I I, I'm, I just feel fortunate um, with how our goaltending looks and you know I, I i watch these preseason games and we got three of them in the books four of them um starting tonight here now and uh it's it's preseason hockey i i don't make i don't take too much out of it but um it's kind of nice to see what players are are making that push and, and what players aren't well and i think t- to that point you got to kind of focus not so much on how the team performs but on those individual performances who's standing out who's fall flat on their face and I've got some opinions on that that I'm looking forward to sharing tonight. (laughs) We are definitely going to talk about it. Let's roll on into that section. All right, Kyle. Camp questions. We got tons of them. We got tons to talk about, tons of players to break down, and uh, yeah, just a lot of thoughts on, on what's happened so far. First, let's talk about the PTOs and what your thoughts are on the PTOs at camp. And is there a chance any of these PTOs make um, make the team? Uh, yeah, well, all all of them have a chance, um, more so than they may elsewhere for a few you, different reasons. Do you think so? I do, and I'll and I'll give I'll give you a reason for each. Okay, good, because I'm ready to write one off, and I want you to argue with me. Okay. Oh, I've, okay. Oh, now I'm excited, but uh, <laughs> Michael Stone, known commodity. Every, again, as I said last time, I'm surprised he didn't get a league minimum deal. So, uh, you know, good playoff last year. Like, good, reliable guy can jump into pinch, as you had said. So, yeah. Um, Cody Eakin, Daryl Sutter type player. I'm not a fan because I think we have enough of that kind of guy kicking around. But, you know, it'll be what it'll be. And then as far as signing Milano goes, Milano is a skilled forward. And I still think they're lacking a little bit of scoring depth in the wings. So, I'm not saying all three are going to make it. I think two or three definitely make it. Um, but I think they've all got a shot. I'll give you my take. If they don't sign Michael Stone, I'm going to be mad. I would agree with that 100%. And I will not be happy either. There is not, and I'm not saying don't, no, I mean, don't, don't message me and say I'm crazy. No, he's not like a top four D man. No. But this guy is a seventh D man that is going to, that is going to be so critical to the success of this team. Yep. He is that yep. guy that can sit in the press box, and I've said it a million times in the show, come right down and play and not skip a beat, and he's a calming factor on the ice. Yeah, absolutely is. Hey, the times he stepped in regular season and playoffs was surprisingly seamless, is how I would, how I would term it. So, yeah, I, I'll be upset, too, if he doesn't stick around. He's got a rocket of a shot, too. And a very accurate one. A very yeah. accurate one. Yep. So I, I hope he makes it. As far as Sonny Milano, I'll be completely honest. I am disappointed so far. 
-hmm. Now I'm not writing him off because I think tonight, I believe he's in the roster tonight. Um, I can check on that as we do this, but, um, I am excited to see how he does with more of an NHL, um, core with him. I'm, I'm a little underwhelmed so far, not writing him off because I do think he's the best chance at filling that forward spot that we need. Um, he is not in the lineup tonight. So that stinks. Cause I kind of wanted to sure. say, that. but anyways, I, I think that he still has a viable chance of making it. I just thought we would see a little bit more thus far. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, and I think it kind of begs the question as to, as we've all asked, how did a guy that had a really strong offensive season not get a contract somewhere? And based on what I've seen so far, I wonder if maybe it's a work ethic thing, and they bring him in on a PCO thinking, you know what, Daryl Sutter's the kind of coach to get the most of this guy. Um, and, and I don't want to suggest that, you know, Milano's a lazy player. I'm just playing with some theories as to why he was available right into training camp. So, um, hopefully we get to see more of him because he, he has the scoring touch that the team needs. Just whether or not oh. they need to fit is the question. I know. Cause when, when they, and I think me and you touched base on this earlier, but, um, I thought many times I'm like, well, why, why is Anaheim giving up on still a fairly young player. Yep. Is there something we don't know? I think so. I don't know what it is. And I'm not saying it's a big deal, whatever it may be, but it, it's, there's, there's a reason, you know, you don't score the clip. You did not have a contract it's, at that age. It's as simple as that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm interested to see what happens there. As far as Cody Eakin goes. Okay. This is what I want to hear. <laughs> I like his work ethic. How could you and, not? And I think he's fairly effective. I'm not saying I don't think he I don't think he gets signed. And here's why. And it's not that I don't think he's a decent hockey player. And it's not that I don't think that he could be effective for the team. I just look at where he's going to fit in. I don't see a slot in the top nine for him. So yeah. he's going to have to fill a fourth line role. And when you've got Rooney, Richie, Lucic, Lewis, all under contract, yeah. I don't see where he fits. I'm not sure that he fits either unless he's going to sign a two-way contract or something, but I suspect he could get a one-way deal elsewhere. So, I, though? I think, you know, league minimum just for a warm... And he, he might have to sit out the first weeks of the season until somebody throws a contract at him, but I think he'll catch on somewhere. I find it strange. I just want to point this out, but... And this is just me overthinking it, maybe. He wore an A for one yeah. of the games to the day. Last night. Last, Last night. night against Seattle. That's right. Yeah. He's on a PTO. And I know it's only training camp. I know it's just so you have a guy that can talk to the rest, but it's like you're not going to take a guy that's on your roster for sure and put a letter on him. You're going to put it on a guy who hasn't even made the team. It, again, for a meaningless game, but I just find that so strange. Sadly, though, who would they have given it to last night? Oh, I don't know. I guess I hadn't thought of that. I just thought it was weird. Had, the guy with the PTO they, had it. <laughs> they, had, they had Dubé wearing one. And he's had a good camp. He's, he's had a really good camp. I've liked Dubé's game well, a lot so far. He's, he's a veteran. Yep. Outside of him, what are you going to have, Connor Mackey or Yusuf Valamaki word? Definitely not Valamaki, but Ma no. Mackey, I could see. Ma Mackey's a good pro. He's been a little bit, yeah. But, I mean, outside of that, Eakin has the only one that has any, like, history of being an NHL player. Yeah, absolutely. Hunt, oh, yeah, totally yeah, totally yeah. fair. I'm just saying it's weird. I just find it weird. <laughs> oh, I thought it was weird, too, because I saw it. I didn't notice it during the game. I saw it on Twitter, and I was like, God, that is all. that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not alone. Perfect. Appreciate it. I, I didn't comment on Twitter about it because I thought, God, is somebody going to crucify me on this one? Because I just, I didn't make sense to me either. But uh, I don't know. Oh, the, the worst you're going to get is a who cares comment. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Who cares? Yeah, good point. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the prospects a little bit. And um, number one, my question is knowing Daryl Sutter and his history, is he even going to allow one of these guys to crack the roster? Hmm. Uh, I hope so, but probably not. Okay. Now, I'm yeah. glad you answered it that way because I got part two to this. I see the whole Calgary fan base just enamored with wanting Peltier or 
Phillips or just one of one of these guys yep. to crack the opening night lineup. And I, I'm not saying I don't want that, but I've always been taught in hockey that you feel the best lineup. I don't care who it is. You feel yep. the best lineup. And I want our prospects to move up and do well. Yep. But I don't want to be one of those teams that forces a, a, a one in and you create a lineup that would be weaker than if we had a, a Milano in or whatever. Yeah. I understand that we want prospects, but I don't want to force the issue. Am I the one that's crazy or what's the, what's the push by the fan base to have this young guys in there? Well, the lengthy history of signing guys who don't necessarily deserve to be signed. And the first thing that comes to mind and, it's not that recent a memory, but it's still traumatic to think about it. It was like when Nick Grossman got a contract and was gone after three or four games. He had no business making that team, and somehow he did. And those examples are the ones that stick with you know with the fan base. Leave it to Kyle to bring up Nick Grossman. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, but you know, more more than just that, and I guess we're kind of getting into some of the the guys that aren't having such great camps by discussing this, but like. Kevin Rooney got all kinds of hate because he was the guy that got signed, you know, as Goudreau left. And that's not his fault. And it's not fair to to crap on him for that, but he's had a miserable camp from what I've seen. You know, he, he, he got, I don't know what he was doing on a goal the other night, but he's basically just standing there. Meanwhile, you got young guys like Matthew Phillips, who's had a phenomenal camp. He's been blocking shots, setting up plays, but the issue, it comes down to where do they fit? Matthew Phillips is not going to play a checking line role, right? He's got to make the top six or he's not, that's what I think. And we're kind of biased based on size. He's already proven in this camp he can do some little things really well that he's not necessarily known for, like, you know, blocking a few shots. But if it's a meritocracy and you want to ice the best roster you can, how does a guy like Kevin Rooney make the team and a guy like Matthew Phillips doesn't if camp continues the way that it's gone so far? I'm hoping and praying that we see a different Kevin Rooney because he because I've been extremely underwhelmed so far. Well, he, he's the guy that should have come in on a PTO. I don't know how he got a contract. Well, if this, is, this is what he brings to the table. If this is what he brings to the table. Now we're going to see tonight because he's centering a, a line. I can't remember who I saw the depth chart too, but he's centering a line with, with some decent players. So I, I really want to see how he does tonight. Um, But yeah, I was pissed off on that one too. And, and the other guy I've been really upset about is use of Alamaki. Yeah. Oh man. This guy can't make the team, can he? he I, I have no idea. If he makes the team, then I don't. Then I then I have no idea. So, well, for him to make the team, uh, even as a seventh D, Michael Stone doesn't. We've already talked about how we feel about him. Connor Mackey, who also had a pretty friggin' good camp so far, and he knows this is make or break for him. He's an an, an older player as far He's as the standing league. Best player last night. Yeah, I have no question. Um, those two guys, unless they both fall off a cliff in you know, the remaining days of camp and Valimaki just somehow has a revelation, which we know it's just, it's not the swing's not going to be that big. Valimaki might be a little better. Those guys might be a little bit worse, but those decisions to me are already made. Yeah. Val- I, Valimaki, like, he's, he, just, he just doesn't look like an Angelo caliber player, which is crazy to think because he was a first-round pick. He was excellent. His first few appearances, his first year and a half around the Flames, and it's it's just been nothing but inconsistency and a lot of bad looks ever since coming out of his stint in Finland. I was like, Oh man, this guy is going to be unreal. He's going to be unreal. And he he has been unreal in the, in the opposite direction. And it's still shocking to me because I penciled this guy in as, as our top prospect for a long time now. And, and now you and everybody else. Absolutely. And I honestly, I hate to say it. I absolutely have zero faith in him now. And, I, I here's my biggest thing, and this is this is bad. I don't know that he has faith in himself anymore. Well, I think anybody that's ever coached or scouted, you know, that you talk to is going to tell you that like the most important thing a player can have is confidence, and his is, you know, not for just reasons of his, you know, like not just things are his own fault, but I mean, you know, the injury that he suffered trying to crack a a coach like Daryl Sutter who leans on his horses and Valimaki hadn't really, you know, proven to be one of those. Um, 
I don't think he has any confidence, and I think if he did, we'd be seeing a completely different player right now. Yeah, I agree. What's your thoughts on – we talked about Mackey and how, how well he's been doing, and, and we talked about um, Phillips. What's your thoughts on Rosiska? <laughs> it's funny. I heard Daryl's comments about him today. Um, he didn't seem overly impressed. I think the kid's got a lot of upside. I think he's going to be uh, like a tweener as a as a forward to start the season. I think he makes the team, but will not the opening night lineup. Um, I, I like his game when he plays it. I do too. I yeah, do too. I really do. And I think last year, see, I saw. I think, and and you can agree or disagree. I, I saw enough last year of him to feel pretty strongly that this guy's a player. Not 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 a top end player, but this guy is. This guy's a decent guy. This is a guy that'll be on the Flames roster in the future. Yeah, and if you know he gets squeezed out of Calgary because of the numbers game, whatever, I think he's an everyday NHL player, or, or he's on the cusp of becoming one. I should say. I think yeah. he's got a, he's got a great uh, toolkit. I mean, he's going to be a decent two way forward. He's got a little bit of scoring touch. Um, Big body, yeah. skate. Yeah, yeah. No, he's got everything you want in, in, a, in a regular player. He just has to put it all together and and kind of bring that work ethic night in, night out, and and play to, to set our system. A guy that many, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people had penciled in as the uh, second line left wing this year was going to be Jacob Pelche. And I'm not going to lie. I'm, I don't know what my expect. I think maybe I was overinflated my expectations, but I've been slightly disappointed. How about you? Hasn't really stood out. Hasn't been bad, which I guess speaks to your, oh, to your disappointment. Yeah. He hasn't been bad. Yeah, I, I don't see him jumping into a into a second line role. Um, I think he can play in the league, no problem, and be a, in a like a valuable piece. But again, because of the way the roster is constructed, I I'm not writing him off by any means. Oh no, no, I I don't oh, think anybody no. is. But but it, how assuredly people spoke of yeah, you know, five six weeks ago he was going to make the opening that roster. Um, I, I think he's a tweener right now. You know, and maybe, you know what, I think part of the problem is this year, you know, all of us that really follow the team hardcore saw an Oliver Shillington last year grab the reins in preseason and yep. just rock our world. I mean, he, he literally rocked our world and, and earned a spot. Uh, I, ex- I don't know why. I expected, like, maybe Pelte to do that this year. Uh, I, I kind of thought he'd be the guy that would maybe do it or, or maybe Adam Raziska would be the guy that would maybe do that. And I haven't seen it yet. The only guy that I think has really made some noise, in my opinion, is Connor Mackey and Phillips. And I worry that there's even any ho- – I'm, I worry that Sutter would even consider Phillips in this situation and this time. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe that's unfair to say. Because I have been impressed with him. Yeah, I don't. But again, this is where the the Flames fan base has all those fears around just you know gifting jobs to veteran proven players. You know, that's why I think Cody Eakin gets a chance because if they can't make a decision amongst these young guys at the end of the day, they're going to go to a known commodity, so to speak, right? Yeah. Especially especially if it's in the bottom half of the roster. That that philosophy is what kind of worries me. Um, but again, if things continue the way they are now, I. I don't know how you cut a guy like Phillips. Pelche, I think, starts in the AHL and makes yeah. sporadic. He hasn't played a game in the league yet. That changes this season. Absolutely. He will. Yeah, he's, he's one of the first two guys to get called up, no question. Um, you know, two other guys that uh, I wanted to touch on that I don't think will make the roster but have really looked pretty good at camp, and that's and that's Connor Zari and uh, uh, Cole Schwint. And yeah. – he has really impressed me. I think this guy is going to be a real deal. Cole Schwinn? Yeah, a couple yeah. of years ago. Oh. Yeah. I knew nothing about him, but I know that the Flames had insisted he be a part of that trade, which is pretty ballsy in their part when you think they already got Huberto and, and Uyghur, right? To get a third piece and a, and a valuable one, you know, good right shot winger. Um, but the yeah. seeming quite a, quite a bit upside by the look of it. So, um, And Zari, too. Like, Zari's a really, really skilled prospect. I think he's trending right where he should be. Nobody expects him to be an everyday NHL right now, but I think he's going to have a really strong, probably point-per-game season in the AHL, and we'll see him the following season. He looks really composed out there. More than I expected, yeah. I mean, for a player his age, yeah. it's uh, 
people, if you look at the prospect pool rankings, like through the athletic or anywhere else, like the flames are pretty well bottom of the barrel because they've sold off so many futures to build the team they have, you know, obviously that's how it works as we all know, but the prospects they do have the few of them that they're, they're hanging on to they're, they project to be good everyday NHL players. And I think Zari is right where you want him to be in terms of his, uh, his development. I do too. Uh, I do too. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think both those guys have impressed. I don't think either one will make it this year, but that's okay. We're they're they're the future of the team. Oliver Shillington. Um, we don't know the details. We don't know the time frame. I'm getting the impression that the time frame is not soon. Are you getting that same impression? Uh, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, just in terms of how uncertain it is, and you know, tree living kind of. Uh, when he spoke about it, I mean, he was kind of vague and I, I, I don't know. I, I think the team should be prepared and likely is prepared to start the season without him. And, and we don't see him till it you know, a few weeks into it at best is that's so, yeah, I guess I agree with you. It's, it seems like it might be a little bit of time before he's, before he's there. So I think there'll be zero argument in the fact that we, we know Uyghurs there. We know Tanev's on the roster, Hannafin, Anderson, Zadora. Yeah. So that leaves basically one or, starting spot and two one to two scratches yeah i see stone being one of the scratches and i see Mackie and malosh arguing going back and forth for that final spot is that am i am i crazy there no i think you're bang on i think you know stone's the right shot um and I think, to be honest, of those two, I think it goes to Mackey. Mackey said a Malash hasn't, been, yeah, Malash hasn't been bad at all. But I think Mackey, I think the team wants to know, at, like now, like is this guy going to be an everyday edge player? He looks like one. Um, so I, th- I think he's the one that they want to that they want to start the season with if Shillington's not available. I, I think they want. I don't know. You know what's that whole. I love Daryl Sutter, but I, it's a whole Daryl Sutter thing. I think he would, if I had to get inside of his head right now, I think he takes Malash just because he's got experience. And yeah. he hasn't been bad. And he hasn't been bad. That's probably my bigger point. He yeah. hasn't been bad. Yeah. But Mackey's been around the, the team. He has. Mackey got some games in last year, He uh, and he's had a really strong camp. So I, I think it's kind of a coin toss. I could I definitely see your point about going with a more experienced guy, but I just feel like based on how camp's gone so far, Mackey's the guy that... That starts if Shillington can't. And realistically, if Shillington's going to miss, you know, more and more of camp, they probably will start the season with somebody else. Give Shillington a chance to, you know, to get caught up. And neither one of those two guys are in the roster tonight, so we aren't going to get to see. Either. Yeah, we're not. You know, if we may as well just defend this, you know, a little bit later when the game's on, because doesn't look to be too much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what what happens there. But um, you know, at least as far as players go. At least we can be happy with where, where we are defensively with Mackie stepping in and, and, uh, and both of us feeling comfortable with him. Um, defensive depth, I mean, every team needs it, and Calgary's, Calgary's got enough to you know to ride the waves. So could be in much worse positions than this, that's for sure. Let's switch gears and talk about the top two lines and how these lines are, are, are going to gonna come together. And I, and I think we'd probably agree that we're going to see Lindholm and Huberto probably start together. And yeah, odds are we'll see Kadri and Majapani start together. Now it's who fills those wing holes? What are your thoughts? Tafoli's one for sure, and I know they're trying him on the top line. I I get it. He's a right like shot. He was uh, he was pretty good when he came over to Calgary. He was a little not He's great at times in the playoffs. At the end of the year. Yeah, he he tapered off pretty badly and he doesn't he's not the fleetest of foot. I don't, I can't even give you a hundred reasons why or a hundred percent of reason why I should say, but I don't see him as a long-term solution on the top line. I mean, he's a skilled player. He's going to pot you 20 goals. I'm sure. But when you think about what they had last year, I'd be more apt to try Manji Pony on that wing. Cause the guy just scores goals. And if you have a setup guy like Huberto on there and you get two goal scores, like Lintol and Manji Pony, that that's what I'd like to see them try. I'm going to argue with you on this one. Ever. I think I think here's why. Here's why I like to fully on the top line. Because he can bury the puck. Mm-hmm. And he's not the fleetest of foot, 
but Matthew Kachuk wasn't either. Yeah, that's entirely fair. He can fill the role that Matthew Kachuk. No, no, no. I'm not saying he is the equal talent to Matthew Kachuk. I'm just saying I think he can fill that spot adequately, probably would be the best word. But I think that, and I think Majapani could do a real good job too. But I can't wait to see how Majapani and Kadri do together. Because I think those two are going to be phenomenal together. I think that is going to be just lights out great. Well, there's always been an argument, and it's a, definitely a fair one, about the strength of duos in hockey, right? So Korea, Solani. Like it, it, people talk about certain lines, like last year with the Flames' top line being the best in the league. But it's often about two great players in a line together, and then whoever's with them has got enough skill to keep up. Adequate, as you said. And that's where this becomes kind of fun, because if you get Lindholm and Huberto, and then you get Kadri and Mangiapane, those two winger spots, one would be Toffoli. We know he's going to be first line or second line. Yeah. And the, the other one, whether it's here or here, it could be Sonny Milano if he makes the team. I know. I want it to be, kind of. Yeah. I can't believe I'm even saying that. <laughs> yeah, wh- wh- why? why? Why can't you believe that? Because the thought that with the depth that the Calgary Flames have, that I'm banking on a PTO falling into the second line spot and being effective is crazy. But you know what? If that does happen, it is ideal because then it gives us a Coleman, Backlund, Dubé shutdown line that I think would be phenomenal. Yeah, and, and Dubé, I mean, well, fittest, fittest player, right? Um, the only... Th- I think it would be a great line, but I, I'm really tempted to kind of see Dubé in more of an offensive role. He had 18 goals last year, you know? I know, but he had some stretches that were so ineffective. Why most am I a Dylan Dubé fan? Most, well, probably because he's had opportunity, he hasn't always seized it in part, but he was much, much better in the second half. And usually when a guy's better in the second half, it leads to a breakout season. He's he my was, candidate for a breakout season. He was more consistent. I'll give yeah. you that. Now, on the back side of the of the season, he was definitely more consistent. Yeah, I don't know. I, I still love that Backlund Dubé Coleman. I just, I just like, I like that line. Now, I'm no, not what? that we couldn't move a Dubé up, but I'm afraid if we can't find someone for the second line, it's going to be Coleman. Oh, likely because he's been plugged in that role before, and, and generally is adequate at it. But he is not yeah. going to. He's not going to elevate the offensive capability of, of that line. He's just going to you know, hold his own, so to speak. I think having him on the third line makes our team better, though, because it gives us more strength through the whole roster. Oh, absolutely. That, that's, what he's, that's what he's best suited for. I guarantee you that this whole organization wants Sonny Milano to just freaking break out and take that spot because it, it fixes so many problems. So does the whole fan base. They screamed for it all summer. I couldn't believe he actually signed the PTO. Because all yeah. summer, it's like, why haven't they signed this guy? Why haven't they signed this guy? Now he's there on a tryout? Like, all right, cool. I wanted Rodriguez, too. And that was the other name that got bad at Where did he wind up? I forget now. Colorado. Ah, oh, that's right, yeah. And that's a great signing by them. Rodriguez would have been a really good fit, too. You know my number one guy that I wanted the most, though, was Stasny. <laughs> really? <laughs> and why is that? Well, he can play the wing and he can play center in, in a pinch too. And that versatility is – I that versatility, if you look that – and that's one thing I love about this team is, you know, Lindholm's center, Caudry's center, Backlund center, Rooney's center. Dubé played center all through juniors, has been tried in the NHL as a center, so he's could do it in a pinch. Lewis can play center in a pinch. Um, you know, that's nice. Yeah. When you St- have that St- 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 a – Obviously, an older player now, but uh, I remember his name being batted a bit last year at the trade deadline. Like he would, he'd, he'd be a good fit on the team for sure. Um, hmm. Yeah, interesting. It was, it was a lot of names that you know would have been fun to have. So I mean, we're lucky we got one of the three we just mentioned really, or may have one of the three we mentioned if he pans out. For sure. So if if tomorrow was opening night and you were Daryl Sutter, who's your top six? Huberto, Lindholm. I'll go to Foley because I know that's what they're working on, and I don't have a problem with that. And second line, Manjipani Kadri, and uh, yeah, I gotta say Milano. Yeah, that's what I would do. I'd give it a go, man. I just another thing I worry about though too is you know just because he's on a PTO with us doesn't mean he signs with us. 
Exactly, but I think if he's tried in that role, if he's if it's you know decided they're probably going to tell him when they offer him a contract, like you know, hey, here's where we're at. We see you playing on this line. Um, then he's probably more enticed to stick around. Well, there's, and that was, there's a reason he signed to PTO Calgary because I guarantee he had PTO offers elsewhere. He must have. He he said that the reason he did sign in Calgary is because there was a potential that he could be in a in a top nine position. So yep. yeah, it all it all makes sense. Time Absolutely. for a little bit of Flames news. All right, time to go through some Flames news, some odds and ends before we uh, roll on out and watch some preseason hockey. The fittest Flame this year, number one goes to Dylan Dubé, number two, Trevor Lewis, number three, Michael Backlund. And uh, the only thing I wanted to talk about this is, did you hear Daryl Sutter's remarks about this? (laughs) No, I didn't, actually. Daryl Sutter blew it off completely. He said, congratulations to Dylan Dubé. That's a great honor. But he says, this year, we had a bunch of fit players, and the margin of difference <laughs> wasn't very much, unlike last year, he said. So that's a good sign that we got, you know. We got yeah, there. well, that's also a shot at how poorly conditioned the team was before, too. And he's never been shy about that. He's often said he inherited a really unfit team, and, and we saw that. Um, <laughs> but what are the metrics here? You know, is Dubé get the lowest body fat percentage? I know they do. A, I know. I, I haven't seen the exact metrics on what they do but i know they do various fitness testing we know it's not pull-ups we learned that with sam bennett a few years ago that doesn't matter but <laughs> <laughs> probably did. I'm, I'm getting sam bennett was probably low on the totem pole of fitness things but uh, probably i don't know um i know michael backland has always been up to the, the top i know mark giordano um used yeah. to be the winner frequently um yeah, I don't know. Well, Dylan Dubé is the fittest flame this year. We'll see how that translates to uh, his breakout year that you kind of quietly predicted, Cal. I'm going to say like I'm going to say like a 2020 season from him, but 40 points, 40 to 50 points. I could I could totally see that. And that's a, that's a good preface because next week on the show we're going to talk predictions, whether it be Flames players and things we yep. can see happening, and then we're going to talk about the Pacific Division and and kind of break down that. So that's going to be fun next week. Yeah, Johnny Gaudreau. He commented this week and said, when I, when I say I love Calgary, it's the city. Now that I'm on, in Columbus, I couldn't care less about that team anymore. Some people in Calgary were outraged. Now, I was not the happiest with Johnny Gaudreau on the way he handled things and, and didn't make bones about that. Mm-hmm. But you know what? For people to even criticize him a little bit for this is idiotic. Well, and I, I tweeted about this earlier in the week, so... Anybody who's ever watched Johnny Gaudreau speak knows he isn't, you know, one to be in front of the cameras and really enjoy the spotlight in that sense. So I think the com- the comments it very clearly states, like, I'm focused on my new team. And I, if, if, if there's any bitterness at all with what he said, if and I don't, I don't think that there is, but if there was, I'm sure it has everything to do with a whole summer of people just going on and on about how much they hated him, how he wasn't that good, how Huberto is better. And it's just it was just a bunch of BS, right? I mean, the guy, there's a bunch of things that happened. Some of it we know, some of it we don't. He ends up leaving Calgary, and it sucks. I hated it. I wish he'd stuck around. But there's reasons he didn't, some of which I think are on the team, some of which are his personal reasons for wanting to be closer to home. But to me, that's just a guy saying, I'm not with that team anymore. My focus is on the Blue Jackets, you know? You know what I think? That's how I took it. He's turned the page. And as much as I was frustrated with him and yep. at times wanted him to be in Calgary, but then at other times didn't want him to stay in Calgary. Um, I respect him. I thought he was a great hockey player and still think he's a great hockey player, but you know, he's turned the page. Come on, Flames fans. Let's turn the page. We've got a lot to look forward to this year. You know? Well, it, yeah. It's, it's amazing that the, that the team got the players they got to remain competitive. You know, remember, remember, remember the day we signed Kevin Rooney when goudreau has gone. It's like, man, this team is going to be awful, and it went the it went the other way. So why people are hanging on to this bitterness and and taking comments that, you know, I just read the transcript, but I mean, I, I just find it so hard to believe that was anything other than I'm a Columbus Blue Jacket now. I loved Calgary. My wife and I loved Calgary. It's a beautiful city, um, but this is where I play hockey. It, it doesn't matter what they do different conference no longer there whatever however you want to slice it just i I think it was just totally out of context i agree Mackenzie weger um 
he is the final piece to the puzzle of the yep. of the giant trade that all of us i think are chomping at the bit to get him signed and elliot friedman reported this week on 32 thoughts that if a deal isn't done it sounds like Uyghur wants to shelf it and not talk contractor in the season which yep. i completely understand yeah is this a deal that can get done is it a deal that should get done and if so what are you thinking uh, yeah, it, I think it does get done, um, and I think it should because this guy is or like a top defenseman in the league whom a lot of people don't seem to realize is a top defenseman in the league, in ter- especially in terms of his two-way play. He does a bit of everything really, really well. Um, I don't think it's a super long-term deal, largely because the team has so much money tied up long-term already. I think it'd be like maybe a four or five year deal, which is still a decent term. And I think the money is what's that, sorry? Well if it goes if we go short term, doesn't the price go up though? Yeah, but it also gives a flexibility in a couple of years' time, right? So I think the number, whatever the term is, is probably going to be somewhere around six. The term is a little bit harder to predict, but I think it's around six mil per year. Um what are your thoughts on that? Where do you see him landing? Do you think he gets signed before? I don't. I, I think it's I, I don't. I think when it's all said and done, he does sign here. It's eight years at 6.5. I'm a little worried wow. it doesn't get done before we start. But if that gets done, he's a part, in my mind, of a not particularly competitive team by year five, somewhere in there, right? I'll argue on, with you on that. We say we're not going to be competitive, but things change so much. And the cap will be different. And things change so much that I don't know. I mean, that would be like saying, you know, Pittsburgh, why were they, why they've been competitive for 10 plus years? More Generation, generational talents like Crosby and Malkin, Latang yeah. certainly help. But yeah. I, and I don't disagree either because the cap, the cap world, things do change really quickly. But I think it's as hard as it's ever been to remain competitive as your core ages because as they're aging out and you're moving on from them, you have to have. Guys like Connor Zeri turn out to what we hope they're going to be. Jacob Pelche, right? I agree. I think the hardest thing as a GM to do, and one of the teams that did it so well for so many years were like the Red Wings, right? They kept yeah. making the playoffs, you know, for so many years. Um, and even in a, in a cap world, for the first few years of the cap, they were still doing it. So that transition period, it can be done, but I think it's extremely difficult to do that, especially as like Lindholm comes off that sweetheart of a deal he's on. You know, you got to re up him for probably 7 million plus or whatever it may be. So there's just a lot, there's a lot of variables there. It can go either way. I agree. I, I, I'll give you that one. I agree with you on that one, but I don't know. I just, I hate to, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm married to the idea that they're going to be terrible either. Cause I'm not, I just think it's really, really well, tricky to remain competitive. So, oh, I think so too. In the cap world. So, so let me ask this one. Would you be upset if they signed him for eight years, six, five, six point five? Would you be upset or would you be happy? I think I'd be happy largely because the way he plays the game isn't... Pre- it's like kind of like Giordano. He's really good at everything, and I don't think his game is the type that ages poorly, where he's like way too physical and is constantly you know injuring himself and breaking down his body. Or he's uh, like a Mike Green type who's just a scoring machine. You know, that touch dries up. I mean, his game projects to age well because he does everything fundamentally well. He's got a very, very active stick. Much like, not to make a comparison at all, but a very active stick, which was one of the best traits of Nicholas Lidstrom, one of the best defensemen ever played, right? If you do those little things well, you, your contract will age well. And, and a number like six and a half, it's not awful. You know, I saw somebody on Twitter say that, you know, dry Seidel McDavid, like you know, if they want 14 million or something, you give it to them. Like, okay, well, you're never going to have a good team because that's just way too much money on one player. Uh, if you give Winger seven or eight, I'm like, eh. but if you're around six, absolutely, I can live with that. Flames injuries is uh, Brett Ritchie. has got a lower body. He's day to day. Just some minor day to day stuff. Nothing Tweaks. major. Yeah. Tweaks here and there. Majapani is back practicing and actually is going to going to play tonight. Um, I see Tanev is on the roster to play tonight, which they said he wasn't going to be playing any training camp games. So, yeah. So that's great news. And and Oliver Shillington, we d- talked on that earlier. Um, that's a little up in the air still, and uh, hopefully in the by next week's show we'll have a little bit more um, insight into uh, if the, how long term this is going to be and, and how that all pans out. But we're staying fairly injury free. Knock on wood. That is good news, and that needs to continue in the preseason.
Get all your Flames Unfiltered podcasts, team news, team updates, and highlights at flamesunfiltered.com. Okay, time to preview what lies ahead for the preseason as uh, right after we had done recording this, uh, Edmonton, or Calgary is in, or no, Edmonton is in Calgary tonight. And then on Friday night, Calgary goes to Edmonton on Monday that Seattle comes to Calgary and on Wednesday, Calgary heads to Winnipeg and then they finish it out on the Monday night, I believe, when uh, they play Winnipeg again. And I, I really look at the, the three final ones, this the Seattle and, and the two Winnipeg ones, to be where we finally decide what happens with Milano, what happens with, with Cody Eakin, what happens with the prospects. And uh, those will be the ones where Daryl Sutter starts putting together a lineup that is more um, regular season ready, I guess. Although tonight's lineup is shockingly, shockingly NHL heavy. Yeah, it is, and I'm not, I mean, there's a little bit of uh, thought as to why that is, I guess, you know, like somebody asked Sutter today if it's because it's the others, he said no, which of course he's going to say no, but the training camp is a couple different things, right? You want to figure out the chemistry we talked about, like just to fully fit on that top line, for example, um, or how good of a fit will he be on that top line, and uh, these guys on, on PTOs, I don't think any of them are going to get cut this week, they're going to come right down to the wire, but you want to get them some reps and, and see how they, how they hold up, and I would say, like, we're going to be due for another round of cuts here over the next couple of days. Tomorrow, probably, yeah. Probably tomorrow. I think by the f- Tuesday next week, we're going to have a much better idea um, of what the roster is going to, sh- what it's going to look like. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. It's because uh, those yeah. last couple of games are tune-up games, right? You're going to have uh, pretty much your roster ready to go. They'll probably wait past Friday night's game in Edmonton because I'm, I'm guessing that Calgary will send a very young core oh Uh, i would think well after after what they're doing tonight i would certainly think so (laughs) yeah i would think that would be the final look at some of the young guys and then the cuts will be made saturday probably but uh, yeah all in all pretty interesting and the regular season gets going october 13th a thursday night stanley cup champion colorado avalanche come to town and then on saturday night calgary heads up the road to edmonton for a hockey night in canada battle and the regular season is coming quick and uh, I am definitely ready. How about you, Kyle? Oh, yeah, 100%. I actually played pickup hockey on Monday night for the first time since May. And just playing hockey again, too, I'm mean, thinking, like, yeah, like, I'm ready to, you know, rush home from whatever I'm doing to, to watch the – well, not even just the Flames, just to watch any hockey. I'm, yeah. I'm, it's we got October baseball coming up, which is super exciting. Yeah. And it's, it's the best the best time of year for sports. You get NFL, yeah. you get MLB, yeah, NHL and NBA all started. Like, it doesn't matter what, what sport you enjoy. Like, it's just – it's the best. It is that time of year, but you know, there, you know, you mentioned going, you know, and playing pickup hockey and, and walking into the rink. And is there be- anything better than that smell when you walk in to start the year? There's something about the way the hockey arena smells. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, there really isn't because it's just so consistent, right? It doesn't matter if you're 15 or 50. Like you just walk in and it's like, yeah, like this is where I'm supposed to be. This is going to be fun, right? Sitting in the locker room after having a couple of drinks and visiting and just the the camaraderie and all, all the people that. All of us have met. I mean, look, we wouldn't even know each other if it wasn't for hockey. So yeah, exactly. It, it, it's, it's a cool, tight knit family, and, and uh, it, it's uh, it's something to fill our cold winters with, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's probably why I gravitate towards it so much. <laughs> we are back next Wednesday night, as we'll record on October fifth, release it on the sixth, and uh, next week's going to be a good one. It's going to be a really good one. Kyle and I are going to break down the Pacific Division, give you uh, our divisional predictions. And then we're going to talk about Flames um, team projections that we have and some individual projections that we have. And, uh, yeah, prediction shows are always the best. Always good hockey talk. And we are back next Wednesday night. Uh, Get on out, watch some preseason games, enjoy yourself at the Dome, and uh, have a good week, Flames fans. Thank you, guys. Get connected. Flames Unfiltered can be found on Twitter at Flame Unfiltered. And also make sure you check out our Facebook page at Flames Unfiltered. Check out host Brad Brood on Twitter at Brad Brood. And co-host Kyle Lewis on Twitter at Van Lewis 14. If you like what you hear, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can find Flames Unfiltered on all the major podcast players. Thanks again and enjoy the hockey action. Oh!
Thanks for tuning in to Flames Unfiltered. Check back for more action-packed Calgary Flames talk. This episode of Flames Unfiltered was copyrighted and produced by Inside Edge Hockey Media Group.